What's not to watch? They're the best at what they do, and I'm the best at what I do, and together it's like, it's on. In case some of you wonder who the best is, they're up here on this plaque on the wall. You sure you're ready for this? I'll do my best. Your best? Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and f*** the prom queen. Here we are, boys and girls. It's the best soccer show on the North American Soccer Network. The web address is nasn.tv. Jason Davis, Jared Dubois, Wednesday evening live edition of the show. We are going to talk. Can I get, uh, can I get something off my chest off the top? Sure. Absolutely. Why I not? poured Go myself a glass of my very nice scotch tonight in order to toast my man, Jason Davis, oh. on... The closing of an error for for, uh, for Mr. Jason Davis. Right, so the closing of Match Fit USA. I'll, I'll toast you with my water over here. All right, all right. Thanks, buddy. Well, I mean, I people that may that. not know, it's a it's a bit of a new beginning and end of a long time for Jason. And uh, a heartfelt congratulations for the work put out for three years on Match Fit USA. And I'm glad it's gotten you to the point where you actually can let it go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's the good thing for me. That's why it's not a sad day. To you know, the the vlog's not. You know, I'm not pulling it offline or anything. It's just I'm not haven't been ha- been able to update it the way I wanted to. It's the you know the quality wouldn't be there if I did. So why not just say all right, that's that's a chapter closed. And yeah, you, like you said, it allowed me to do all this. I wouldn't be doing this show if it wasn't for Matchfit USA. I wouldn't be writing in the places I do uh, without Matchfit USA. And that's it. Now I don't want to draw this out. It's not. <laughs> I get really uncomfortable when you start examining. It's, it's our show. We're yeah, not like big corporate sponsored show. If we want to talk about something, we'll talk about All it. Right. And I want to say congratulations uh, to you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. There's a lot of very nice things said on, on Twitter to me today about Match at USA. Uh, three years is about as long as a, a blog tends to run in, in the internet world. It just Some blogs last forever. If you're Denord, you go for seven years or however long he's been doing it. But most of the time. People, Not everyone you know, can be Ives and Bruce. Right, right. And, and people, you know, move on to different things and start new projects. I mean, uh, some of my good blogging friends, guys I've, I I even know because of Matchfit USA, have closed down blogs and started new ones. And that's that's part of the deal. I mean, I'm not going anywhere. I think that's the most important thing is that I'm not, you know, I'm not disappearing. The sad thing is when a blog stops being you updated. You can't go anywhere. I wouldn't be able to do the show. I <laughs> well, don't have any of your skills. I just meant that, you know, it's sad when a blog dies because it's nobody updates it and you don't know where that guy went. He just drops off the face of the earth <laughs> and you're like the worst possible things run through your head. And and I don't want, you know, that's the good thing. The 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 blog launched a quote unquote career if you want to call it that. But let's move on. I, I you're making you really are making me uncomfortable. And we've got news good. and notes and things happening. We are live on a Wednesday evening as usual. We are taking phone calls. Best soccer show on Skype. Uh phone number is 201-430-2378. That's 201-430-BEST if you like the the not the letters that are on the numbers. They even do that on phones. Well I guess they yeah. Of course they do. Yeah, they do, but you know, they I do. can't do it without looking at the number. Like, it, like I get phones now, like modern phones, they don't even have the letters on the numbers anymore, so I can never do the acronym. Yeah. Do you want to guess who our first call of the evening might be? Uh, a guy named John. A guy named Jonathan is on the air. How you doing, Jonathan? Hey, how you guys doing? We are, we are uh, hanging in there. What's up? First of all, I'd just like to say, Klinsman, are you even watching? <laughs> get it off the bat. I, I love that. Fantastic, yeah. Sasha Kleshin. You have to clarify though. Who is he not watching? Well, let me let me let me let me aid Jonathan here. Sasha Kleshin in the Europa League uh, for Andalect against Lokomotiv Moscow today, or Lokomotiv, or however you say it. Uh, scored a goal, played very well. He's got. Uh, they they dropped this stat, which I probably should know because I follow Brian Sharetta on Twitter, and I'm sure he's put it out there. But apparently, uh, Sasha Kleshin has played more minutes for Andalect this season than any other player. So he's obviously a stalwart now for that team. We weren't sure if the move was going to be a great thing for him. Uh, you know, Celtic fell through and everything else. He's he's gotten a lot better. And there is a uh, hundred times a hundred. Are you even watching? Should be bouncing around right now. <laughs> yeah, I was I was just wondering. I always get I always get excited when I mean it's still pretty far away, but the January camp is calling up, and I was just wondering who you guys think may get like some new players who make it the call up. Like I personally think that possibly God should be called in and possibly 
Sapong could be called in. I know he's a little too old for the U23, so mm-hmm. I think those two have a good shot of both being called in. Yeah, you, here's here's the thing for me. I'm not convinced he's going to treat it the way Bob Bradley treated yeah, we this don't, camp. We, we don't know that, do we? I mean, that's the thing. We, we called it Camp Cupcake right, for a reason. Right off the top, there's an away game dur- in, in this camp, and that's a new thing and we haven't ever had during this January window. And obviously, the, the you got to think that the big Euro players aren't going to be available to this, but I'm not putting it past Klinsman to treat this entirely different than how Bradley, uh, Bradley okay. always had well, in the let, past. Let's say it this way. We, one, we don't know that Klinsman will treat it the same way. But two, it's obvious to treat it that way. I mean, he, if, you have, if you have guys out of season, MLS players, if you have guys out of season in Scandinavia, and these are guys you should be giving looks to, there's absolutely no reason. Now, the, the problem is, and, I, and this has come over the last couple of years, the problem is that the team is kind of, it's so makeshift, and it's so many guys that are new to the program, uh, haven't had a shot in the national team yet, maybe we're on some youth international sides, but haven't been in the U.S. setup for a while. It's its kind of, I don't know, how much can you judge that? Then you start looking at, okay, let's look at individual performances. Well, it, what was it, three years ago, Sasha Kleschen scored a, a hat trick against Sweden, and, and it looked like his star was going to be on the rise with the national team, and it just didn't happen then. I mean, Sasha, I don't think Sasha was ready then. So it's hard I don't to think know. We, did we mention that in all this talk, the reason that he, that John's even calling to talk to us about this today is that he scored yeah, in I the Europa, that. Europa game today? Yeah, I, I did mention that. <laughs> when I, oh, did you? I, did, I might have lost that yeah. in the middle of it. But <laughs> the goal is quality. It's the type of goal no, I no. personally saw Shasta Cleston score for Chivas USA at the Home Depot Center when he was what I would call, quote-unquote, his prime. He had that one really great season with Chivas USA where Chivas USA made the playoffs. Uh, he was the whole reason that the team had a great successful year. It's probably about three years ago now. Mm-hmm. But it just shows that he seems to be on point. It's, it, the, the goal today was an instinctive one. The ball fell to him quickly. Uh, gets the ball off his foot right away, right up into the corner. It's 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 the type of goal a a striker that's in form scores. Yeah, well, it, it, it's been uh, well. I mentioned the the potential move to Celtic that fell through um, before he ended up going to Anderlecht, and and that he it, there was the George John effect. It was like the Sasha Kleshin effect before George John had it this season, where there was a rumored move, it didn't happen. He he didn't play very well after that. He just kind of dropped off. His form Maybe went to that's crap. a question for Taylor Twelman in the next segment. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so a guy who has denied. some experience with that. Uh, you anything else, John? You mentioned. Uh, did you say you said Gat? Who else are you looking for for this camp? Uh, possibly Sapong. Okay, CJ Sapong, who I think a lot of people are high on, but everybody talks about CJ Sapong in. It's almost like NBA terms. It's almost like freshmen come out of college. Where okay, <laughs> he's. He's he's it's all potential. I mean, yeah, okay, he scored some goals and he won Rookie of the Year, but he's raw, raw, raw. It was raw, potential raw. a year ago. Now, I mean, the guy kind of he guy he proved kind of it, didn't he? He okay. kind of clear the first few bars of what his expectations were. Okay, well, no, yeah. I mean, if you win Rookie of the Year, you're obviously doing something right, and you can't really be said to be uh, under delivering on promise. I I just I don't know. I mean, I I think that. I think that he should be in a January camp if he if Jurgen Klinsmann treats it the same way Bob Bradley did, but that and we don't know that. I'm thinking back upon like the rookies of the year of years past in MLS, and I think for the most part the rookies of the year have a pretty good run in terms of MLS standards. If you think uh, going all the way back to the New England Revolution with uh, Clint Dempsey. Uh, I believe was it uh, uh, it's Pat Noonan. It was still mm-hmm. playing. You may you can decide whether you think Pat Noonan is still a great player or not. But for a number of years and for a long career, Pat Noonan has done well in this league. Right. Uh, Sean Franklin, Omar Gonzalez, recently uh, C.J. Sapong. There's a good history of week is the year doing well. There obviously there's going to be some that drop off the face of the earth, and that's going to be expected. But right. I think it's a actually a pretty good thing and a pretty good track record. Unlike it's not like the Madden curse or anything. <laughs> Uh, all right, thanks for the call, Jonathan. Let's move on. I, I, I do hope he treats it like the like the Bob Bradley January camps. I really do. I think that that's the best way it's to go. It's the only Why chance some of these guys I'm convinced are going to get a look with, from Klinsman. Right. Why wouldn't he do that? I mean, it, it, but with an Olympic year coming up, a lot of the guys that would have been in, in Camp Cupcake from MLS are going to be in the, the U23 mix. So maybe there's in not December. as much... Maybe the the pool's not as large as before. Maybe he has to go a little deeper into MLS. I I don't know. I mean, we start throwing out names, but I I don't want to speculate. I have to go in and look and see what people are talking about. Uh, Klinsman's high on this winter loan stuff, Jared, and, and I think that that uh, these guys that are heading heading over to Europe. Um, where's Zagadell right now? It's, he went to Liverpool after being at. Uh, I'm blanking at on Stuttgart, his. I on Stuttgart. 
Okay, you've got Tim Ream, who's at West Brom now after being at Arsenal, if I believe. Some people I mean, say maybe right, he'll so. spend an extended period there. Well, that's that's what I wanted to hit on here is that uh, Tim Ream is at West Brom. He's impressing at West Brom. They're talking about, we'd like to have Tim Ream on loan. And Eric Soler, uh, the GM of, of the New York Red Bull, says, no, not so fast. We'd rather him not. We'd rather him stay here. Uh, that just means the price wasn't right. Well, I no, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I I think MLS teams are, um, I don't know. I I think they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. If if the player wants to go and and train in Europe in the off season and that's going to help his national team uh, prospects, how can you keep him from doing that? But then if if he, Tim Ream's national team prospects really hurting right now, I mean yeah. the guy's been called in consistently no, but, during but the, during Klinsman. But it doesn't matter. I mean, the guys that have been consistently playing under Klinsman are still going to Europe to train because they know this is how you stay in the boss's good graces. If he says that this is going to help me, then I'm going to do it. So Tim Ream goes to to England to train. He impresses somebody. They're talking about we want a loan, and now New York has to say, well, we'd rather him not. And and you can understand um, New York's position. Let's say Tim Ream gets hurt while he's with West Brom. He's done for the year if he does a knee or something. I don't, I don't know. I mean, these are just the possibilities. You don't want to put him through that. Training, he could, he could get so hurt does, in training. You could get hurt in training, does Omar too. Gonzalez, but... Does Omar Gonzalez then get punished for playing on the Galaxy? By playing on the Galaxy, he had to play an extra month more than a lot of these players that are already gone over to Europe. Plus, the Galaxy schedules the big road trips through Southeast Asia, and he doesn't even get back. His season basically didn't end until a week ago. So right. does Omar Gonzalez miss out on training abroad and possibly getting the experience that Klinsman's requiring of players because that's he, a good question. unfortunately or fortunately, plays for the that's, MLS champion team? That's a very good question. I mean, you can make the argument that, that Omar Gonzalez is handicapped by his club situation because they are so good and because they do have the marketing clout with David Beckham in-house to go and play games in Indonesia and in Australia and the Philippines. That, that Surely that's on par with the, the, the English Premier League training, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Playing against yeah. Panama and yeah. Indonesia. Playing, play, Panama. Playing against those teams. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I say Panama, Philippines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just funny that the the Pandora's box is completely wide open now because because David Beckham forced his way to Milan because Landon Donovan takes the opportunity and follows Beckham's example and goes play goes and plays at Everton, which still want him back to this day. Every you know, it's having two winners in a row now where they want him back on loan, and he you know either L.A. comes out and says no, we're not gonna let him go this time, or he doesn't say he never says anything, does he? Donovan never says if he wants to go back. He just he just kind of leaves it hey, open, right? That was pretty good at keeping a, his his lips sealed. I mean, even he's, during the whole Friedel thing, I don't think we heard anything from PC. either it, Donovan or yeah. one of his outlets. He's not. He's uh, there's not. a question in the chat room. A question in the chat room. I want to ask you. Okay. It says uh, this is from uh, We Ill. I'm pretty sure that means Will, but uh, <laughs> couldn't we fix the problem of U.S. players going overseas by getting better coaching and training within the United States instead of wasting money on DP on DPS and put some money towards coaching? Uh, isn't that long term versus short term though? Oh, it's it's all it's 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 all a balancing act, isn't it? I mean, if you if you buy that DPS bring more interest, which brings more marketing dollars, I mean more sponsorship dollars. In the end, you know. I don't know. I haven't seen the ledger. I don't know if I could say for certain if you didn't pay Rafa Marquez, if you didn't pay David Beckham, if you didn't pay Terry Henry, you could invest in better coaching and, and better standards. I don't think that's necessarily true. I mean, these clubs run their own budgets. For as much as this is a single entity league, all these teams do their own thing when it comes to how they train and you know how often they train and what that's all that what coaches they hire. That's their job. They they do that. So. I don't know. I mean, I... well, I, I got to take on this, and it's not necessarily MLS specific, but it is U.S. soccer specific. You see that with the success, the financial success that the U.S. team has had at the World Cup and uh, the Confederations Cup, and just in general, the success that U.S. soccer is having, especially through SUM, is you are able for the first time to afford a $2.5 million coach. So the mm -hmm. money is getting put back into the system and the coaching ranks. Now, whether or not you're investing in the American coach, that can be debated, right. but you can say that the money that is being made is being invested back into coaching in the U.S. Yeah, there's there's something. I mean, like you can't really point to one thing and say this is the problem or why are we spending money on this and not this. It, 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 everything balances out, and just because we it, it, just because MLS teams weren't paying DPS doesn't mean that money would directly go into coaching or, or anything that that might help the players. I mean. It's all business stuff. All right, let's take a break. We forgot to mention Taylor Twelman, the top of the second break. 
to talk to him about, uh, I don't know, everything. So the best soccer show, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Back on the best soccer show, boys and girls, Jason Davis, Jared Dubois. On the line with us now, Taylor Twelman. You don't need any introduction, right? I don't have to give like a, I don't have to give a resume for Taylor Twelman, do I, Jared? That would not be necessary. So. Other than saying he's Mr. ESPN now. That's right. How are you, Taylor? Good. You want me guys uh go on for two minutes? You want me to read my resume or what? <laughs> no, 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 no. We we we, we got <laughs> Uh, Taylor, uh, we, you know, I, Jared mentioned Mr. ESPN stepping into the, uh, into the booth to be the, the, the color analyst for ESPN's coverage, uh, in 2012. Uh, I obviously got to be excited about that. I want to ask you, um, about that move, what that means for you. If you saw that coming this, this fast in your broadcasting career. No, God, no. I mean, it's, I said it the other day to a couple uh friends of mine. I said, if you would have told me I'd be comment commentating when I was playing and uh, getting going, I would have told you you're completely out of your mind. Uh, it was something that's completely come out of the blue for me, but I absolutely love it. I enjoy it. And uh, let's be honest, I've got so much work to learn. The way to – I just got to learn the TV business and all that stuff, but the one thing I don't need to learn is my, my energy and my enthusiasm, and I'm really, really looking forward to the opportunity. Yeah, the fresh uh, take in the booth is nice, and I think a lot of U.S. soccer fans uh, are, approve of the move. Uh, obviously, you're no uh, stranger to uh, a quick learn, and we kind of want to start talking a little bit uh, with uh, something that, that Jason and I have talked on on and off over the last couple of weeks, and that's the future of, of college soccer. Um, obviously, you uh, spent one year with Maryland before moving on to uh, Germany, 1860 Munich. Do you find that the college system is still necessary? Obviously, you use it as a short-term stepping stone to the professional career. Do you see the college system is still having a part in large process or any large part in U.S. soccer development? Um, I do. I mean, it's still a huge part of our culture, so I don't think college soccer needs to go anywhere. I think... The NCAA trying to get rid of spring soccer and trying to propose cutting the regular season by 10% is kind of it's ridiculous. I like to see it go the other way. You know, maybe you play 15 games in the fall, 15 in the spring, and maybe College Cup is in, you know, competing with the College World Series and give it a chance. So, you know, we're not playing games in 30, 40 degree weather. I think it's a huge, huge part of our um, stepping stone for MLS, but I also understand that. It's only a three-month season, guys, and that in order to, you know, every other college sport is the stepping stone for the professional sport, but for some reason, the NCAA can't get around that. Soccer needs to be played nine, ten months if, if kids still want to go to school and improve themselves as soccer players. So I don't know the direction it's going to go, but I like to see it still play a part. Hey, Taylor, just to follow up on that for a real quick second, uh, to explain a little bit. You made the move to Germany a bit before it was the norm for Americans to be making that move. Obviously, now we have Americans playing all over the world, especially in Europe. Can you take the listeners into a little bit the process that you had the flow to get? How did you get noticed by scouts in Germany, and how did that happen in a time before Americans really had uh, any real presence in Europe? Um. I won't bore you with the whole story because it's a long one, but it was the under-20 World Cup. I was the first American to ever win a bronze boot, uh, anything in the goal-scoring category of a World Cup. And 1860 Munich and Bronby in Denmark offered me contracts. So that's how I got to 1860 Munich. But this is before the 2002 World Cup run, mm -hmm. and this is right after the 98 World Cup run. Keep in mind, guys, we were awful in the 98 <laughs> World Cup. Yeah. And so the respect of Americans, there was none. You know, shine and shoes, uh, make sure you take care of all the balls, cones, and everything. That was a normal process for an 18-year-old. Now throw it on the 18-year-old that was an American. Needless to say, it was a very humble experience and something that at the time was a huge struggle. But I don't think I'd be sitting here talking to you guys having the successful career that I had if I didn't go to Germany and kind of get that rude awakening. Uh, back to the college game, just briefly. Do you think it's – is the college game getting markedly worse 
uh, Taylor, because I, I mean, I wonder with the way that, that MLS is improving in, in developing players, I mean, it might take a while, but it doesn't seem to me that, that people are really high on the standard of college soccer. And I know that's kind of always been true, but without a, without an Akron in the mix, and I know North Carolina can play a little bit, but other than those teams, is there, is it, is it good soccer? I mean, is it even worthwhile for these kids to be playing this kind of game? Well, I don't know if I'd say it never was because my partner in crime at ESPN, Big Red, Alexi Lawless, <laughs> right. look at his generation. Right. They, they, that generation of players, you either went to college or you didn't play. So there's some serious quality in college soccer. And then in 1998, when I was in, you know, in college, there were still players going. There's very few players leaving high school the way Landon Donovan did, mm-hmm. DeMarcus Beasley did. There's a couple of examples, but there's a lot of guys at UVA, a lot of guys at Maryland. So I think the transition has turned into this youth academy with the MLS teams in a homegrown player role. That's going to change it. I, I, you know, I joked with Rob Stone before the game. He said, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, we're going to call two semifinal games and yet the entire first round might be at this college cup right now. And I don't know if the talent's at that. North Carolina is the best team all year long. They won the college cup. They may have, they may have, depending on who comes out, they may have six guys drafted guys. Mm. So I, I don't think the talent's not there. I just think you're going to get to a point eventually where that talent isn't going to be there anymore in the sense of players are going to go to homegrown the players that play in the academies and stuff, they may not be going to college. Right. And that's where I think yeah. college soccer is going to lose those players. Taylor, let's talk about the, the, the ESPN move here for a second. And the, obviously, for people that don't know, you were the voice of uh, the Philadelphia Union along with uh, J.P. De La Camera. Now, uh, getting the full-time job with the ESPN, uh, what do you anticipate of the moves? Uh, what's the difference for you in terms of doing union games versus ESPN other than having to learn a new uh, play-by-play person to work with? Obviously, you've worked with one of the best American talents ever made in J.P. De La Camera. But is there any real big change for you going to the ESPN level? No, uh, not at all. I mean, to, in fairness, my first three games ever were with ESPN. Um, I treated the Philadelphia gig, and it's one of the few regional TV gigs that feels like it's a national gig. Mm-hmm. So when you work with JP, you work with the quality people at the union, I already felt like I was doing a national gig. Yeah, maybe I spoke on behalf of the union more than I probably did of the other teams just because that's what you do as a home broadcast. But I'm really trying to just be who I am. And hopefully, and I think it's going to be the case, that with Ian Dark and with Adrian Healy and, who are, and Rob Stone and whoever else I'm working with at ESPN, I'm just going to be short, sweet, to the point, and allow the play-by-play guy to be the voice that you guys remember. And hopefully you just remember me coming in here and there and trying to point out things that I'm seeing and observing and try to really be the American version of what the English guys are doing over in Europe. We got a cut. We put out uh, a call for questions for you and got one from uh, from March, Mark Fishkin on Twitter, or I'm sorry, he sent us an email. I said, uh, congrats on the new gig. Who do you look up to as a color commentary role model? Who, who would you hope to emulate in that job? Um, it's, you know, it's hard because in soccer, when I was growing up, there was no soccer on TV, <laughs> right. you know? So I, I work with the legend in my eyes in JP Della camera color wise, there wasn't really anyone that stuck out. And then when I started coming, but when I came back to MLS, it was Ty Keel. And then there was the Eric when all this John Harks, I try to watch a game and I'm just trying to do what I would appreciate when I watch a game and, you know, when I see a lot and when the game's full of energy, I'm full of energy. But then when the game's now, I don't need to be talking the whole time. And that's kind of what I write on my note cards and everything and just really try to emulate because when you watch a premier league game, the color guy is not always talking. Mm -hmm. And I think we need an American to come through and prove that, listen, if the English guys are going to come over and do the MLS games, guess what? (laughs) Maybe the Americans can can go over and do a Premier League game. <laughs> nice. 
You don't know how happy that makes my co-host here. <laughs> that you say that. Uh, we have, like uh, Jason was saying, we put a, uh, the feeler out there for questions. Uh, we had a couple questions uh, on an issue that's near and dear to your heart, Taylor, and that's the issue of uh, head trauma in soccer. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, is from a guy named Josh, and he says, my name's Josh from New York. I, offer, uh, me, I suffer from post-concussion syndrome and have done so for about seven months. I just want to know if, there, if he has any tips on what are the best things to do to get better. Maybe any words of encouragement, too. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, tell one, Josh should follow me on Twitter. I'm always uh, giving out advice or anything you can do. Uh, seven months of post-concussion is very difficult. And um, anything that you, you – the, the thing I tell anyone suffering from post-concussion is – be proactive about understanding what you're dealing with. And what I mean by that is have a log, have, have, take notes, what triggers your symptoms, what doesn't trigger it. And what people are, what I'm starting to realize with people is people still don't take it serious enough and they have the injury. You know, they're like, oh yeah, I've had headaches, so now I just go run eight miles and I head the ball. Well, the reason why you still have headaches, knucklehead, is because you're running eight miles. So. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on, and really, Josh, you're going to get better. Um, but follow me on Twitter and get at me at Twitter, and I, I can help you that way. Uh, another question in that same area. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is from, I don't know, Jay Robardes. <laughs> Terrible name. Uh, my mediocre, okay, pathetic Sunday morning league career was pretty much ended by a concussion a few years ago. He says, it seems to me like a no-brainer, pun intended, to require padded helmet padded helmets at all levels of the sports of so of the sport excuse me do you think we'll ever see that so i guess helmets at all levels levels of soccer yeah i mean what's funny to me though if it's a no-brainer then why do we have we have helmets in football and we still have concussions we have helmets in hockey we still have concussions right that doesn't make any sense it's not a no-brainer that you wear a helmet you don't get a concussion it makes no sense because if that was the case then we'd all be wearing helmets every single sport out there and you wouldn't get a concussion. And as we're seeing with Colt McCoy and the Browns, you got a helmet on and you hit another player with a helmet on, the force is a lot more mm -hmm. strong and it's a lot worse. And, and so, yeah, I, I feel awful, obviously, for you having a headache, whoever that was on Twitter, but I, I'm, I'm concerned about the helmet thing because too many people think, oh, it's going to prevent concussions. Well, that's not true. Well, there's a very big dividing line in, in the history of hockey of the pre-era of helmets and the post-era of helmets. Do you feel that this is something that we're on the cusp of at least making a decision on in soccer? Uh, it, whether you're for it or against it, it seems to be a hot-button issue right now. And hockey is one of the more recent ones to really take a stand on it. Right. No one said I'm for or against it. I'm going by scientific research. And there's no research that says it 100% prevents concussion. And that's not why hockey went to them. Do you know why hockey went to helmets? Do you know why football went to helmets? Your uh, team identity. Uh, <laughs> over okay. Your team identity. Imagine right. no NFL with the Green Bay Packers, yellow helmet, the Steelers, black helmet. The 49ers gold helmet, the Notre Dame gold helmet. That's your team identity. That is the number one moneymaker in football. Mm -hmm. So the helmets are never going to go away. But don't tell me it's not for or against it by any means. If I was, I'm all for finding a way to stop concussions. But the point is, is that every other sport that's gone to helmets now has a concussion epidemic. So. I, how the concussion is going to stop or how helmets are going to stop concussions in soccer, I, I'm not seeing it. And if I see scientific research that shows that, that it will stop concussions, mm -hmm. then I'll be the first person to sign on the dotted line. Right. That's a, we got bigger, stronger athletes these days. It makes it tough to know wh how much is, is down to that and how much is down to, you know, to just whether or not the helmets work in that situation. Uh, let's move to uh, to some uh, other topics close to your heart, uh, Taylor. Up there in New England, lots of things happening. You got the the Revs have a new head coach, a guy you played with, Jay Heaps. I got to ask you about uh, what you what your outlook for his his team's gonna be. We talked to uh, Michael Parker just a couple weeks ago, and all he really gave us was that they'll work hard. Is that pretty much all we can say about Jay Heaps' team right now? 
Well, you know, they'll work hard in the sense of I think they're going to work more efficiently. Okay. Um, I, you know, in saying this, I think what people need to realize, Steve Nichol was a professional coach at one team for 10 years. In this day and age, that's unheard of. It's absolutely unheard of. Now, do I see a Dominic Kinnear in Houston maybe making a run at that record? Guys have 10 years. So I don't think maybe it is a different voice. What I'm starting to see with the off-season move done by the revolution is that they kind of believe it looks like that they just needed a new voice because you bring in a disgruntled Shaw Reed Joseph. Uh, you bring in a Matt Reese. You know, guys that are kind of at, you know, they're really not changing the guard. They just really just change Jay Heath. So Heath is going to come in. They're going to prepare better than anyone. They're going to be a lot fitter. And so the work hard is a general statement, but there's a lot of aspects that I think New England needed that work hard mentality. And I think they're going to be a lot tougher to play against than they were over the last two or three years. You know, Taylor, you brought up the name Steve Nichol, and uh, that's a, 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 I'm a big Steve Nichol fan. I actually put his name down as uh, one of the people I would like to see him get the U.S. job before the Klinsman announcement was out there as someone that already knew the American player but had like a foreign experience to him. Do you think he stays in MLS, or do you think, uh, uh, do you think he wants to go back overseas? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I don't think he wants to go back overseas. I, I think Stevie came here for a reason. I think he likes the, you know, way of life. I think he likes it over here. I think he also likes the non-pressure that's here as opposed to taking a job over there. I, you know, my, I, I'll tell you what I texted and spoke to Steve Nichol. I said I'd be a little patient, and, and, and he's deserving of, you know, having a look around the league and not just taking the first job that comes his way. So Steve is deserving of another job in MLS, and I think he's going to get one before you know it. Well, you might have avoided that Rapids landmine for the time being. Um, Taylor, you mentioned you say that though, but look at that roster. Yeah, no, you know, I, like I just mean that front office is a mess. That's what I mean. The front office is is a mess in Colorado. But I'll tell you one thing: that roster just is it's it's two years away from winning an MLS Cup, and yeah. you got a guy like Jeff Lorenowitz that you can build the center of a midfield around. I don't know that 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 roster looks fairly enticing. Yeah. Uh, they got to keep those forwards healthy, though. Yeah. Back in New England, Shari Joseph got a new contract. They made him a DP, Taylor. As a guy who uh, played in MLS at a time when uh, the DP rule came into effect and maybe watched as foreign signings came in for big money and the Americans were maybe a little passed over or definitely passed over. And Shari, you know, being uh, uh, developed in this country playing college soccer here, is that a win for, I don't know, for you guys in, in a sense? Well, the DP rules done almost a 180 since I was done playing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's gotten to a point now where you can have three. I never played it in, in, in any part of MLS where there was three DP. You know, I remember the first year where it was the Juan Pablo in Hell in New York. It was the Beckham in L.A., even though they were paying Landon more. And then they said, okay, well, now we got to fix this. So it's two. Now it's three. And there's a lot of reasons why you want to do DP now, because if the owner wants to fork that out of his pocket, that opens up a lot of salary cap room for another player. And that's exactly what New England was doing. Is Jonathan realized that in order, because of the 5%, we need to keep Shaw Reed Joseph. Maybe if I pay this out on the ownership side, then his salary cap hit isn't as high. And it's allowed Jay Heaps, Mike Burns, and those guys to now go out and scout more players and make maybe a better decision because if you're going to pay a DP like Shaw Ree at age 33, who's going to be 34 fairly quickly here, mm -hmm. that's a risk. So better that risk be taken where you not are getting killed. You're not getting killed on the salary cap right, uh, hit. Taylor, I can't let you out of here before I ask you some kind of fun question. I'm going to give you an either or here. Which would you rather participate in? A sports reality show that follows you and Alexi on road trips in a two-seater convertible <laughs> to every ESPN televised game or a show that chronicles you going through an entire preseason of camp with the St. Louis Cardinals? <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Is that, I mean, I Which, love Big Red, but you, you give me the St. Louis Cardinals. In a heartbeat. He 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 brought that question up. I said, "There's no way he's you not taking it." You think your skills are still polished enough that you think you'll come off okay? No, but uh, Mike McCini <laughs> and I are 
I say colleagues, friends, due to our concussion uh, common ground, and I'm very pumped for him to be the manager. I you. Tell me right now, you hand me a glove. I can go play shortstop right now. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> now, hitting, you put a guy on the mound, Josh Beckett, who throws 95 and then throws me an 82 mile an hour curveball, <laughs> and I'm going to look like Bug Bunny going swinging five times in a circle. That'd be, the, the reality show would be fantastic, though. You and Alexi <laughs> driving around the I country. I do think, in all seriousness, because that one's not real, I do think following Alexi and I on an internet show. Or something on ESPN.com, which I've proposed to a couple people. I think it'd be funny because you, we really are the yin and the yang. Well, how many empty Slurpee cups be in the back of that car, though? <laughs> be we we just I gotta tell you, I mean that's part of the transition of TV that's been so much fun. When you work with a guy like Alexi that makes it fun and that enjoys it, and who's a lot like you, where he doesn't take your. He, he doesn't take himself that serious. And right. obviously you can tell by this conversation, I don't take myself <laughs> serious at all. So we, it, it's fun. It's just good old fashioned fun. And we both enjoy watching MLS and international soccer. We, we just like working together. We, I mean, it's going to be tough not to see you guys interacting in the studio setting next year, but it's, it's excellent that you're moving up to the booth. We, uh, we appreciate the time, the time Taylor. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on with us. No worries, boys. Be good. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Thanks. All right, let's take a break, everybody. Uh, it's the best soccer show on North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. When we come back, several other topics on the agenda, including us. Houston's got a stadium name, Jared. That's exciting. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Jason and Jared back on the best soccer show live on a Wednesday. What evening of December is this? The 14th? Is that right? I got that right? It is the 14th. December 14th, 2011. We are live. Uh, 201-430-BEST. 201-430-2378 is our phone number if you'd like to call in. Maybe you got comments on uh, on talking to Taylor and what uh, Taylor brought up there. I mean, lots of... The, the guy can talk about a lot of different subjects. I'm glad we talked concussions. I think that's important whenever you talk to Taylor. He he's got to be among. I'm I'm more I'm more stoked that our listeners got to ask questions. I didn't realize yeah. we have listeners that are going through what he's going through. So if we can at least give an outlet, then that's a good thing. You know, it's 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 calling it an epidemic. I think scares a lot of people, but there are there are concussions every day in every sport, and and people have to deal with them. And sometimes, you know, it might mean the end of a career prematurely, and that's that's sad, and that's that's. Terrible, well, but I can remember playing both as a as a high school player, and then even now as an adult, when I play that, every once in a while I come home and I get halos around things for about a good hour or two afterwards, yeah. and like I don't really think much of it, but it, like it makes me kind of double think, like maybe I'm not taking things as seriously as I should be sometimes. I think it's the biggest thing is breaking the culture, and it's much more prevalent in uh, American football than it is in soccer. But I think even in soccer, you get this mentality of the the tough guy mentality, or the oh you just got your bell rung. Well, there's no such thing. I think I've heard Taylor say this. There's no such thing as just getting your bell rung. If you get your bell rung, that means your brain has been traumatized in some manner. That doesn't mean like you're going to be de debilitated if you play again. It just means that you better be cautious about how you treat your body and you treat your, your brain for whatever period of time it takes for those things to, to work themselves out. And that's it. I, you know, we talked we talked real quick about uh, Tim Ream going over to, to West Brom and whether or not that's going to be something is for sure or not. What do you make of the Henri to Everton? Is that like the most <laughs> out-of-left-field thing that's out there right now? That is David Moyes being a desperate, desperate man with no oh, cash David to David Moyes is desperate, that's for sure. Yeah, no, he's, he's just a desperate man. And when you see Thierry Henry in the hallway, uh, I guess that was at the Emirates. I can't remember, but it was Terry yeah, in but London. Yeah, the guy literally just had a, a statue unveiled of himself <laughs> in front of another team's stadium. <laughs> how do you? First of all, it's how do you have the balls? You to go up to him yeah. in the tunnel and say, "Hey, how'd you like to come over to our team?" I, I think it's just, I like I said, I think that's just the level of David Moyes' desperation at this point. They have no cash. They can't spend. I, mean, I give the guy all the credit in the world for squeezing out any results. 
with with the lack of, of financial backing he has that club and lasting and just sticking it out and not being one of those guys who goes out. Oh, there's no money. There's no transfer kitty. I'm I'm done. I'm leaving. I, I'm gone. Is I'll David go find another Moisten job. Everton, is David Moyes and Everton kind of similar to the Steve Nickel and New England Revolution of MLS? It's just the ownership versus a good coach a good in comparison. a bad ownership situation. It's a very good comparison. I think there's a lot of parallels there. I mean, obviously, David Moyes is in the Premier League, and it's a different kind of spotlight than Steve Nichol ever yeah, but I'm had. Not sure his, I'm not sure his management is. No, no, no. I, I mean, I think you're, you you make a good point. I, I, I think in, in Everton, their hands are tied by revenue and, and what they have to work with more than ownership saying. And they, they're they trying to sell the club, so they're trying to get as you know money into that team. Whereas New England, there it's the Crafts who have all the money to spend on MLS, and they just they don't want to. It's it's that that team is not their team. Their team is the New England, New England Patriots. So it's it's a different situation in that regard. But I think you have a point about just not having the money to spend and being being tied, being uh, locked into kind of a mediocre roster and being asked to do amazing things with it. In Everton's case, that's a mid-table finish. In New England's case, I think that's the playoffs, and they didn't they didn't make it this year, and that's why he got fired. That's why Steve Nichol got fired. I think it was best for all teams around. It. I mean, all parties involved in the Steve Nichol uh, issue. Uh, the other news that came out yesterday, uh, or was it today? I guess the announcement was today. The news hit yesterday. Houston, their new stadium, which is taking form very quickly. Jared has a name. What is it? It's. They're all BBVA cool. oh, yeah. Compass Stadium. Yeah, BBVA. Wow, Com- that I'm... is not easy to say. <laughs> it doesn't roll off the tongue. I, I think it's going to be. How soon before competing supporters groups start finding all sorts of fun like acronyms that BBVA stands for? <laughs> oh, that'll be nice. That'll be fun. Well, I mean, every team, every stadium that has a corporate name needs a either a nickname or a colloquial name, just a, a local name that it's referred to, right? I mean, okay, take, for example, I don't drop in some American football, but I'm a Denver Broncos fan, and the the stadium was Mile High Stadium. They moved into a new stadium. They slapped on a corporate sponsor, right? The people in, in Denver still call it Mile High Stadium. It's not the original Mile High. Yeah. It's something, something at Mile High. They just call it Mile High Stadium. They, they leave the corporate sponsor out. St. James's Park is something, whatever, sportsdirect.com. It's going to be St. James's Park forever. It's going to be, you know, no way the Geordies are calling it sportsdirect.com park when they're talking to each other. They're calling it St. James's Park. So what are yeah, the Houston Ars- fans? Arsenal got it right. The only way to get the people to actually call your stadium the new name is to build a new stadium. Well, I'm just, If they the, try to change the Broncos, Highbury to Emirates, everyone will still call it Highbury. Yeah. They, uh, they, they, they make a new stadium and they, they bring down Highbury, turn it into condominiums or whatever, I and guess. people now call it uh, Emirates. Oh, so that's pretty much the only way to do it. But by Houston starting off with BBVA uh, Compass, that's what it's going to be called. Yeah. Well, they'll find something else. We got a phone call from the area code seven from area code seven oh six. Who's this? Hey, it's Pedro, guys. How you doing? Hey, what's up, Pedro? How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I wanted to ask you guys uh, an opinion on expansion. Uh, some expansion rumors, news coming um, down the pipe today with the Sacramento stuff and. Um, you know, you guys had uh, Orlando City uh, on last week. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now especially with the Cosmos apparently imploding, which as a Red Bull fan makes me exactly <laughs> happy. Um, you know, where? I mean, realistically, um, where where does MLS look now? New York is looking less and less likely. You know, as long as a shot as Sacramento is, I mean, no. They're not that desperate, right? It's not ha- Sacramento is never Pedro, going to happen. This is Pedro, never happen. I solved this problem today on Twitter. I don't know if you saw. <laughs> Napa FC. Wine country, <laughs> baby. Think about it for a second. Wine country. Who has more disposable income yeah, and that's looking right. to spend it in frivolous ways yeah. than wine people? Oh, they would dr- yeah, though they would show up in droves to watch soccer in Napa. No, seriously. No, I'm though. saying you make it on the outskirts Look, of San Francisco on the way to Napa. And you, you you get your Bay Area team, but you you have like wine sponsors, and I'm telling you, there is so okay. much money that people just piss away uh, in wine country. No, I'm, I'm more of a fan of the rice to be honest. <laughs> oh, Look, the, the thing about Sacramento is the thing that the Sacramento, and I don't know where, what market they are number wise in the country, and I don't know what the population. I was actually born there, but I don't know what the population of the city is. Uh, but I think that they have a lot in common with with Orlando in that. There's only one other professional team in the city. It's a basketball team. You're, you're, you know, there, there's a chance to get some, some mainstream interest out of the media because that of that fact. Because there's no same thing in Portland 
which which works to Portland to the Timbers' advantage. That the, all there is and otherwise. San Antonio is too. Yeah, and down in San, San Antonio to in in a way too. So there, these markets I think make sense for MLS in a in a lot of ways. But I I think that you do have to think. You know, Sacramento's just not sexy. Okay, yeah, they got an San, San Jose has ruined Northern California for everybody. Probably, probably. San, they get San two Jose bites of the took apple. their show on the road, traveling from city to city, and didn't really succeed anywhere. Yeah. So you got to think, what? How much? How much uh, interest is there in another Northern California team if the first one can't even be a success? Yeah, but Sacramento yeah. doesn't even count. I mean, I know that's Northern California, but it's it, how far away from it from San Jose is it? What's the distance? I don't know. The I mean, five cow lengths. How do they that, measure that, stuff that factors up there? in too? I mean, the thing about Orlando, the thing Orlando has going for it is it's it's a a new candidate with a committed ownership in a that already has a team in the city, in in a region that doesn't have a team yet. And we talk about the southeast needing a team and blah blah blah. If that's if that's true, when MLS buys that line, then they may lean Orlando uh, before they'll lead anywhere if else. I have to make a choice between uh, between Sacramento and someplace like Atlanta. I'd at least like like to give someplace like Atlanta a shot. Yeah, you have someplace to. in the southeast you that, can, that can East hasn't even got a shot yet. Florida kind of had its shot. Well, I get where my man's going with with Orlando, and he did pique my interest when he was on the show for sure, but. I'd rather give someplace else a shot that hasn't had one yet that's clamoring for one. Atlanta, Vegas, baby. I'm not even opposed to Vegas. Uh, I, Vegas yeah. would be fine. I mean, there, there's a lot of candidates out there. Vegas would be fine. Have you been to Vegas? No. What I mean for I mean for MLS. I, I there there are a lot of considerations, and I but and everybody mentions all of these cities, and and when with DC United, you know, on the the cliff edge with their stadium situation, people talk about where they could re- relocate to. The the issue for me is that. You have to have committed ownership, which means you got to have somebody with deep pockets. I, we didn't get into this with Phil Rollins because I don't, I don't know if we were actually allowed to. He's got to have partners. He doesn't have the pockets to buy an MLS, so he's got to have some partners. You need cash. You need a stadium plan. Okay, so if there's a stadium plan in place in Vegas, there's a stadium place in a stadium plan in place in Sacramento, and they've got you know seventy million dollars, whatever MLS is going to ask this time around, and we heard a hundred million bandied about. When New York was the leading candidate, I mean, that, I think those are the factors. And then from there, you talk about okay, does this market make sense in this way? Do they have enough soccer fans? Do they, you know, what's the ratio of young people that would come? All of that, 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 that business. And they love stuff. the downtown location too. Now, right? You got to put this. You well, got to put the stadium in a place that's going to drive interest. We're discounting just because Cosmos may not be an option that New York still isn't. Those no, I, I know. I, I'm not discounting New York at all. I mean, Pedro mentioned the, the Cosmos falling apart, and they are. Terry Byrne's gone. Uh, David Beckham's best friend slash Cosmos, whatever but he Terry was. Terry Byrne only can last one year at any American job yeah. before he gets fired. And, like. and they lost their communications director. I think her name was Teresa Tan. I don't know what that's about, what both of them leaving at the same time is about. I don't know. But the Cosmos seem to be imploding. They've got new ownership. They bought out uh, some, some – uh, what was it? Is it a, a Middle Eastern it's concern? A chic or something. Bought right? out uh, Kemsley, so they're they're in flux. They might not be step up to buy, to be New York too, but that doesn't mean that somebody else won't. I mean, the Wilpons I think are still in play, even though there's a lot of questions surrounding them. Chuck Blazer's name keeps coming. Chuck Blazer and that, that group that excites and, me, and and I'm desperate on to get someone on this show from this uh, get somebody on this show from that group. Be it Chuck Blazer, love to talk to Chuck Blazer. Wouldn't just be about an expansion, would it? I got. I would uh, just want to have a whole segment on on ma- how you manicure a beard like and, that. And and Curtis Martin, the the ex NFLer, is in the mix. Thanks for the call, Paige. We're gonna move on. I, 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 expansion drives me nuts because I think people just let their imaginations run wild when it, it it's much more of a practical concern for MLS. Um, and, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I don't know what their what their timeline is for Team Twenty. They pushed it. They pushed it back. I think. I mean. They're not talking about it as quickly they as they to. Who's in, who has a plan in place ready to go? Well, I, mean, that, I think that's what Orlando's trying to position themselves as, is that team that can step in right away, or that, that group that can step in right away and be Team 20 in 2013 or 2014. And, that, and, and well, then what do you do? Do you stop at 20? Garber's made noises about stopping at 20. So what they have to get, you have to get out of the mindset though, that you're going to make a move and bring a team in just because you need to bring a team in. You got to bring in the right team. That's, in the right yeah, place. That's what I'm you can't just say, right. we need team 20 by 2013. It's right. not going to, it can't happen like that. It's, it, that's the combination of factors, right? It needs to be the right market with the right people involved with the cash, with the stadium. They all have to come together. And, and just because Barrett Paulson and, and, and Vancouver, and you know, we don't know about Joey Saputo as an owner yet. But they, all those people had – all those combinations of factors came together at the right time. And they already had built-in fan bases. 
Orlando's working on that. Vegas doesn't have a built-in fan base. Fan base. Uh, Sacramento doesn't. Anybody else doesn't. I mean, Saint. You could argue Saint Louis does just because of history, but they don't have a team right now. So there's there's a lot of things. I don't know. I'd I, love to see something. I'd love to nuts. find a way to make professional soccer work in St. Louis, but I, it, it just does. So far, the attempts at it just haven't been successful. But I'd love to see it. Let's move on to uh, to Americans over in Europe. The Europa League uh, took place today. We've got a minute or two here, and we'll carry this over. Clint Dempsey scored. Yay, Clint Dempsey! Uh, way to bounce back. Yeah, and we mentioned at the top of the show, Sasha Kleschen scored. Um, so, the, yeah, but Fulham went out. Yeah, despite the fact that Dempsey scored, they got pipped at the end by, was it Odense? Scored at the yeah, death. Yeah, they had to win that game to move on. Scored at the death, and, and they're knocked out. So uh, Fulham is done. And here's the question about Fulham. Um, do, does the fact that they're out of the Europa League, they're struggling in the Premier League, and who knows what's going to happen with Martin Yole, does that mean that Clint Dempsey might be closer to a move than he's been in the last year? It seems like year? there's a it seems like there's a lot more reasons to move than to stay at this point, doesn't it? I mean, he has he can prove himself if he moves on to a bigger team. He can maybe get to a team that plays consistent Europe uh, European action mm-hmm. and maybe get a, a bigger pay, a pay raise and profile move. Yeah. I, it, there just it, there isn't enough rooms reasons to stay other than do you want to still be there and become even more of a Fulham legend. Right. And he's one of the only crowd. Americans that's ever played overseas and it's achieved that status already with a team. Right. And he but he's got good he's got years as opposed to McBride who, you know, came back to MLS and, and was pretty much done in Europe. He's got years left in him. He could move on and still be a Fulham legend. All right, let's take a break. That's twenty eight. Yeah. Well let's take a break and when we come back we'll close this one out. It's the best soccer show North American Soccer Network, NASN T V. Don't go anywhere. Back on the Best Soccer Show, Jason Davis, Jared Dubois closing this out on Wednesday Night Live Edition. Thank you for the phone calls. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for your tweets. Thank you to Taylor Twelman. If you are, you know what's not okay? What's not a, what? Bad touch? No, when the <laughs> ice melts in your scotch and you have sediment at the bottom and uh, you can't figure out what it is. It's your water, dude. It's your town water. It's terrible. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, speaking of Americans abroad, we touched on that briefly in the last segment. Uh, I think that's the highlights. I mean, uh, Marisa Du's in line for a new contract, and there was an article where uh, McCoyce was calling him a hardworking American, which annoys the crap out of me. But I don't want to have time to get into that right now. Uh, but we do have a, a new show on the best soccer. I'm oh, sorry, the best. A new a new show on the North American Soccer Network. That's a, an Americans abroad roundup. You guys should jef- definitely check that out. Go to nasn.tv for that. Uh, very good uh, segment. It definitely fills you in. And it's actually very and good highlights. quality video. And too. highlights, yeah. You get to see some things. Uh, just like yeah, you, you, you want to see the goals, the old baby goals that yeah. uh, Americans are scoring uh, right. abroad. Check that, uh, check that segment out. Go ahead and check that out. Guess who got added to the U23 roster, Jared, right after we talked about him on Sunday? Do Terrence I cheat because I know who it is already? Boyd. Yeah, you can answer it. If you know the answer, just say the answer. Terrence Boyd got Terrence added. Terrence Boyd got added. And Kellen Rowe from UCLA got added, who I like because I watched him uh, playing some Milk Cup games last year. Uh, so I'm I heard, out, outside the Duke players and a couple of North Carolina ones, he's, he's that one player that's kind of standing out right now. He's the guy that uh, that I think people are excited about um, over there on the West Coast. And he, he played a part in UCLA's um, College Cup run. They didn't make the final. It it wasn't. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the result of that game was. Now who they it was lost a shootout to. loss. They lose to. Were they the ones that lost to UNC Charlotte or was that? Um, did they lose to UNC? I just remember, I just remember they lost to UNC. Loss. I don't remember who it was. I'm pretty sure they lost to UNC. I think that's the game. Yeah, that's. My, we didn't get to talk a lot about the actual. Anyway, I'm Cup stoked results. to see Terrence, which makes me wonder why was the weight on Terrence Boyd? Was there something not getting him cleared to leave uh, his club? Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I wonder things. what that was. Could be a lot of factors. I mean, are you really gonna wring your hands over why he wasn't on the first roster, or are you gonna be uh, excited that he's on this roster? I don't know. I'm just, it's, it's weird to me. I don't know. <laughs> you got a conspirator. Well, here's conspirator the thing. If he's mind. available, he seems a clear cut addition. So there's got to be something different behind the scenes that held that up because I don't see why you wouldn't bring him in. He's playing great for the, the under 23 side for his club team. He's looked really good every time he's played for the under 23 U.S. men's national team. He seems like he's a, he's a no brainer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that at that level, that that's where his level is, right? I mean, yeah, we talked about that on, on Sunday, that the possibility was he was – that Klinsman – or Klinsman – Porter wasn't bringing him into this camp so that he could have a shot to work his way 
into the uh, senior squad uh, with his club. And that, you know, I, I obviously that's not a concern right now. Maybe they've been given guarantees or maybe the club has said we'll release him because he's coming up in January anyway. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the I, I don't care. He's in the he's in the group. That's exciting, right? That, that's what we care about. That he's in the yeah, group. and like I said, I've been wanting to see what he and Teal Bunbury can can do together. So I I, I think we might get that chance now. Uh, last note here before we get out of this uh, this episode, uh, WPS got sanctioned, and we didn't get to cover this a lot. And and I didn't, frankly, I don't know all of the details. I haven't been able to follow. But I suggest if you if you care about women's soccer, you follow uh, Bo Dora on on Twitter, Dora Sport, uh, Jenna from All White Kit. Who else am I mentioning? F- from a left wing. All of these people are documenting this event, and they were there was some concern, but they've got sanctioning. WPS will be around in 2012, and that's a I don't know. There's some debate over whether that's a good thing long term. Which is the more shady uh, a sanctioning, NASL or WPS? Uh, well, if you want to go on number of teams, it's WPS, but uh, NASL NASL keeps getting provisionally sanctioned. So I don't, know. and it's the same thing for WPS. They provisionally sanctioned. They got to add teams, and they're talking about it. They're, uh, Eventually, they'll get somebody lined up. It's just that they lost uh, Magic Jack FC so fast because they kicked him out of the league. They just didn't have time to replace him. Follow Jeff Kasuf on uh, on Twitter as well. Uh, the Equalizer. He's got excellent coverage of women's soccer as well. All right. is that? I think that's going to do it for us, right? That's it? I We're think done? that's about it, dude. Okay. Go to iTunes. Ratings and reviews help us out a lot. Uh, go to NASN.TV to see the show and subscribe to the show. RSS feeds, all of that good stuff. We're on Blip TV, on Roku. We're on Apple TV. We are in a million different places. Uh, you can uh, send us email show. I'm sorry, best soccer show at nasn.tv. Follow Jared on Twitter because that's fun. Leave us voicemails if you want. Yeah, Jared on Twitter is J R O D I U S J Rodius. I am Davis J S O J S N. I can't even say it. First time you're I've ever said it on the yet. air. You're not used to it. I know. It. I changed it. It's da- Davis J S N. That's part of the whole death of Match Fit USA thing. All right. <laughs> we're going along here. I think we're done. We're done? All right. Let's get out of here. Thanks, you guys, for listening. We'll talk to you on Sunday. Bye. Troy and Abbott in the morning.